Hi, everybody. Welcome to a Fancast webinar on audio workflow optimization. I'm really pleased to welcome you today. We have many uh, Fancast experts on board. They will uh, showcase uh, Extreme Software, our software solution for radio applications. Thank you for joining us today and taking time out. This webinar will last 45 minutes. If you have any question during one of the presentation, please feel free to use the chat. Our expert will uh, answer them immediately. You will also get a chance to win a Fancast Polo and a Fancast Cap with our traditional quiz. So stay tuned. And last information, I will send you the link to the recording by the end of the week. Let me uh, introduce now the speakers of the day. Florian Wickert, Senior Development Engineer at Fancast. Bernd Geiser, Senior Audio Engineer. Thomas Schlin, Senior Software Engineer at Fancast. And Tobias Donbush, our Product Expert. Let's have a look now at the uh, agenda. After a short Fancast introduction, Tobias Donbush will give you an extreme overview. Then our Fancast expert will give you a deep dive into extreme application using concrete uh, radio use cases. The first one will be WDR on OTT streaming and DVB, then Dutchland Radio on podcast processing, and finally, uh, Classic Radio, our latest uh, project on playlist scheduling. I'm going to leave now the floor to Tobias Donbush for a Fancast introduction and extreme overview. Yeah, thank you very much, Virginie. Yes, I am Tobias Donbush, uh, officially the uh, product expert, so meaning the, the first contact person for a lot of things. And uh, I'm going to give you a, a quick introduction of um, Fancast as a company, what we do, where we come from, and then um, also an overview of our core product, Extreme, which is going to be good uh, background knowledge for some of the use cases that we're going to uh, take a look at in a moment afterwards. Right. So who are we? Uh, the way we define ourselves is as... Uh, an audio logistics company. Uh, what we mean with this is that we both on the, um, as far as the products we offer, the services we offer, but also uh, consulting and the like, help you get your audio from A to B. And uh, no matter what kind of uh, protocols or formats uh, you need, no matter what kind of special wishes you have, we get your audio from A to B, and sometimes also to C, D, E, and F, G, et cetera, uh, depending on the situation. And the main way, but not the only way, how we do this is via our core product, Extreme, uh, which you can see there in the center of the screen there as well, or in the slide here. Um, this is actually a software solution um, that runs as a uh, operating system. It's uh, Linux-based, but... Uh, mostly created by us or customized by us. And you can install this on just about any kind of hardware, uh, also in virtual environments, or we can even provide this uh, as cloud installations for you. And with this, you can uh, handle various kinds of live and non-live audio transmission applications, also recording and so on. However, although Xtreme is our uh, core product, and we define ourselves as a software company as well. We do also offer hardware included solutions. This is specifically for those customers who prefer classic audio encoder, et cetera, uh, complete solutions. And there's basically two important distinctions here. On one hand, we have the uh, so-called audio codec servers, which you can see an example there on the right side of the screen which are basically more or less generic hardware, server hardware in a lot of cases, also mini PCs and so on, um, that we have specifically chosen to run our software on. And of course, also including uh, various kinds of interfaces for 
both classic and uh, new kinds of uh, audio interfaces uh, as your use case requires. And on the other hand, as you can see on the left, is a very new product. We only introduced it at the uh, IBC last year. Is the so-called uh, fan report, which is actually a uh, touchscreen controlled uh, reporter codec. So it's actually you're running on a Raspberry Pi, has uh, this uh, well-known sort of tablet interface. And this is specifically meant, as the name implies, uh, to be our solution for reporters. So you have uh, all the controls that you would expect from reporter controls, like game um, control, of course, picking your contacts and so on, all via the uh, touchscreen instead of uh, classic knobs and faders. One very important aspect uh, about FanCast that we often also like to highlight is that the fact that we uh, define ourselves also as a, a team of people, specifically as uh, part of our corporate identity, we see ourselves as approachable, uh, supportive, and we usually try our best to be as close as possible to the customers, You know, guide them every step of the way. I mentioned uh, also the consulting angle earlier. So it's very important to us to be close to the customer and uh, support them in any way we can. And I think this will also become obvious uh, once you hear a bit more about the uh, use cases later. Um, a few words on the applications. As I already mentioned, we uh, cover, a, uh, cover a, a huge range of uh, different uh, use cases. Of course, we will see some examples later. Here's just a... Uh, a few examples, really, just to give you an idea what we can do. We don't need to go into any uh, more particular details here, but just to get a general idea, it ranges from web radio, DVB multiplexing, of course, any kind of uh, transcoding, as you will see. Um, SIP communication contribution is, of course, also very important, as you can guess with the, the fan report and so on. But also relatively new protocols and approaches are also covered, like for instance, doing the contribution via WebRTC and so much more as well. And as you can guess, we have, although we're still a fairly young company, we have actually um, quite a few big and uh, happy customers. Um, originally, of course, we were very strongly focused on the uh, German market, especially uh, the um, public radio stations, but since then we have gotten uh, both partners and customers all over Europe and also internationally. And in fact, this is just generally our development right now is uh, to expand wider internationally. Right, which brings us uh, to the other topic I will uh, talk a little bit about, and this is the solution itself, especially how it is controlled and what you need to know to understand the uh, use cases that uh, my colleagues will talk about later. Just a quick word here while we have this uh, screen up. One important question we had to ask ourselves when we designed Extreme was, okay, we have this, or intend to have this very flexible software solution for audio streaming, et cetera, with that we want to uh, cover all sorts of applications with all sorts of formats, encoders, et cetera. How do we actually display this to the customer in a way that is user-friendly, that is intuitive, that actually you know, makes sense to uh, have the sort of one size fits all uh, control scheme. And the way how we handle this is via the so-called pipe concept that we came up with, which I can explain to you in a Bit more detail now. So the pipe concept, quite simply, is uh, as I mentioned, of course, a, uh, a control and configuration scheme. And the idea is that the entire audio workflow, everything that happens in the extreme system, from the input to the output, is displayed as this uh, row of elements, as we just simply call them, this, these colorful circles that you have here, and. So, of course, on one end, you have the input, and then everything that happens to the audio signal, um, all kinds of processing, of course, the encoding, which is obviously very important, um, all the way to the sync, which is the output or destination, is displayed as this uh, row of elements. 
So in this simple example here at the top, we have a regular audio interface that's connected, could be like an analog XLR or maybe a, a digital MADI card, for instance. Um, it's the signal is MP3 encoded and then goes out as an ICECast stream. But by the same token, any sort of audio communication could be configured. So this is in fact the uh, menu for how to do this, the edit pipe menu. And as you can see here already, you have a variety of sources, of course, classic audio interfaces, audio over IP, which would be like AS67, Ravenna, Dante, etc. cetera. Um, but uh, also more, let's say esoteric things like uh, actually using an existing web stream as an input or de uh, demuxing a uh, DAV, uh, DVB, OFM signal and then using specific programs from that as input for other things as a sort of format conversion. Then in the audio processing, more or less everything else that you can do with the uh, signal, including our loudness control, which we're also going to talk a bit more about later. And then of course, with the uh, encoders, the codec algorithms, obviously, and then you have the variety of syncs, anything from web radio to uh, recording, streaming it somewhere else, et cetera. Right. One quick thing, because this is relevant to a couple of the uh, use cases we will see later, I want to show in a slight bit more detail is actually our metadata insertion. So this is of course, relevant to web radio, obviously, to uh, any sort of podcasting, but also things like um, DVB multiplexing. And the way how we handle it, as I, as you see here, we have a specific element for this that you can uh, insert into your pipe. Obviously, it usually wouldn't be at the start, but uh, in the middle. But uh, the way how we handle it is you have three separate layers of metadata. And uh, for each one, you can either uh, manually input a set value or define a, um, for instance, an HTTP uh, push or pull to receive it from a separate system or get it out of uh, UECP data. And the way how it's intended is that uh, static metadata would be in the base metadata. So this would be things like the, the radio station name and so on, things that are not supposed to change. The overlay has the dynamic changes and the fallback would be if the overlay can't be updated because maybe there's a connection issue and so on. And then this is uh, you know, um, used as a placeholder of sorts. So we can take a quick look inside here. And uh, you can already see here um, the different kinds of uh, inputs or even outputs that you can define like a UACP port if that's how you receive the metadata, for instance, for DVB or the uh, HTTP here. And uh, you see only a very limited list of things that you could uh, also input uh, manually instead of via these um, automatized updates. But in fact, if we change to the expert view, there's a, a very, very long list. So it's uh, all the ID3 tags and more, uh, including some tags that are specific to specific streaming protocols and so on. Okay. One tiny little thing as an addition to the pipes I quickly want to talk about or at least show. Um, you can also group pipes together. Normally, the point of this is simply to allow you to uh, control multiple pipes at once, uh, which as you can imagine is very convenient if you have like a larger system with hundreds of uh, communications configured on the same system. But this is also how, for instance, for HLS, you can uh, configure an adaptive bitrate stream. So you have multiple, the same source basically, but different bit rates configured. And this is then of course offered to the listener as an automatic adaptive bit rate stream instead of three separate streams, as you might imagine. And similarly, this is also how you set up a uh, DVB multiplex where of course each individual program is one pipe, but then you define this as uh, to be uh, moxed together before it is then in fact uh, streamed out of the system. Just to have a bit of background there. And with that, I would hand over back to Virginie who is going to uh, quickly uh, tell you our quiz for the day. Thanks uh, Tobias for this great um, extreme uh, overview. Can you see my screen? Because now it's time for the with. Now, here's a question today. It's a precise 
question and the answer will be in one of the coming use cases. So the question is, which three quantities does NGLC optimize? So if you stay with us, you will uh, soon understand what is NGLC and you will also get the answer. Please use the chat to uh, write your, your answer because the, 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 of course the right answer, but also the, the fast one will win. And please use the chat also during the coming use cases uh, if you have any uh, question uh, on them. Uh, let's move then now to the first uh, use case. Thomas Schlin is going to show you a WDR um, use case on OTT streaming and DVD. Yeah, welcome also from my side. I'm very happy to see so many people from around the world joining this webinar. Very nice. Um, yeah, I will start with the WDR's use case, and we also have two other exciting cases today. <clears throat> it's also a little bit of our history. So we started with OTT streaming and then added all the features you will see in the next uh, slides and uh, by the next presenters. And um, yeah, so let's start with this. So um, on the WDR side, we, um, <clears throat> we get the signal from the radio studio via AA67, and they do different things with that. So the first one is to uh, to use it to produce an icecast stream, which is then streamed to a CDN. And then they also use it to do HLS in parallel, um, and also uh, they do max uh, DVB signal of all stations they have and send it to a satellite. So now I will go into detail with that. So we first start with over the top streaming. So the classical audio internet streaming stuff like Icecast and HLS, for example, but also it would be Dash, which we also, which we also support, <clears throat> but it's not used at WDR. Um, we get an AS67 input. It's a Ravana input in this case. And um, an important thing is that they actually bundle stations to, um, uh, to one stream. So they have four stations bundled, and this helps to reduce the number of packets because AS67 always uses 1,000 packets per second. It's hard to handle for the network interface. And so, uh, yeah, that's a good idea always to have. <clears throat> so they actually have 25 stations, which include regional and event stations. So, for example, WDR2 and WDR4 are regional <clears throat> splitted, so I think in six, seven, or eight regions. So uh, that's why they have so many stations here. Uh, and each station, station is um, sent out with ICECAST in MP3 encoding uh, with 64 and 100, uh, 128 kilobits per second. And they also do HLS streaming with three bit rates you see here in AAC coding. And what's always important for our customers is uh, safety. So um, they use two servers, one for main and one for backup streaming at different locations. So if one server fails, they still are sending out the stuff. So now we'll go a little bit into detail for two ways to send the audio. So one is Icecast, it's HTTP based. We use the libshout library to distribute the stuff to the CDN server. And it has a delay between five and 30 seconds or even more if you set it that way. And um, it's always dependent on the client, how much buffer it uh, takes. And yeah, so it's not very low delay, but I think for normal live streaming, it's fine. So for the main and backup solution, um, the synchronization is done at the CDN normally. Uh, we just get the signals and send it out in the same time, but we do have not any influence on that. In contrast, it's a little bit different in uh, HTTP live streaming, which is uh, HLS. It's uh, HTTPS based <clears throat> and also based on file segments. So um, for example, there are five second segments that are produced and then they are uploaded to which uh, via HTTP to a server, to the CDN. Um, its origin is done by Apple and now it's an RFC. Uh, so you can see the number here. And so the delay is between five seconds and you can, <clears throat> and upwards. Uh, normally, so the, our customers use like five second segments. So 
and the client always um, loads two of them before starting the, the playback. So it's more like five, 10 to 15 seconds delay. And one uh, different thing here is that the main and backup are actually created in Xtreme. Um, and uh, this is, yeah, so I will go on to this a uh, little bit later, but now uh, we have also some other HLS features, HLS features. Uh, so the support for different editions, so you can have different quality levels, as we have already seen uh, it in the WDR setup. And uh, also some, uh, you can also have some different languages and also redundancy, which is very important here with primary backup. And this is all <clears throat> actually decided by the client, so that one has to support that features. So um, the primary and backup config must be in sync on both the servers, which have extreme, and the alignment is actually done by using the, the word clock, so via NTP or PTP. <clears throat> and so on each server, the start of the segment is aligned to that clock, for example, to every five seconds, and exactly at second zero, five, ten, and so on in, in a minute. And so you always have the same segments if the the input is synchronized, at least. A nice thing in Extreme is that you can do the configuration in one place. So you can do the configuration for HLS in one encoder and then export the config imported in the peer encoder. And you do have not, you can uh, select while importing that you actually want to use that encoder as a backup encoder. And so you just have to do it once and um, it's, not so error prune if you do this only once. Yeah, so uh, one of the advantages to have HLS support in Extreme is that you can <clears throat> use actually our playlist features and we can also extend uh, stuff we support. So you do are not depending on big CDNs. If, for example, if you're using uh, Akamai and former times, you had uh, the possibility to, to use RTMP streaming to them and they converted it to HLS, but they did only support very few options for that. Yeah, next up is the DVDB. <clears throat> we also get um, HES, AES67 input, like for uh, the other audio OTT streaming. Uh, here we have nine stations to MPEG-TS, so that's more the number of the real stations, so there is no regionalization. They use AAC with 128 kilobits and one station is uh, the classical radio is with 256 kilobits per second. One nice thing is that they actually use for the classical station a switch between stereo and multi-channel audio. So and they have some multi-channel um, stuff uh, and so uh, they switch between that. So in, in, for example, on Saturday evening or so, you can listen to 5.1 multi-channel sound. And uh, the switch between these is actually uh, triggered by a web RP call from their side. So they have a control system which actually does a web RP call and then it switches from stereo to multi-channel or backwards. Um, an alternative would be to use, for example, a metering level of the center channel. So you always uh, input the 5.1 signal and measure the levels on the center channel. And then you can also switch between stereo and multi-channel based on that channel. So if the <clears throat> if it's high enough, the signal, then switch it to 5.1. They previously outputted this MPEG-TS signal via a DECTEC ASI card, <clears throat> which, also, which is also supported in Xtreme, but now they use uh, RTP network like all other ARD stations. So uh, we have lots of features uh, implemented for DVB. Um, for example, you can set extra PIDs for example, for HPB TV, which is also used by WDR, um, you can adjust the timing intervals for PCR and so on. You can do metadata insertion. Um, we support two ways there. So one is embedding in the AAC codec, and the other one is to send it via an extra PID. Um, you can have UDP, RTP, and ASI output. Uh, you can set language codes. You can set the minimum and sounds profile level for the AAC codec, for example, which is useful for the switching of the um, uh, streaming with stereo and multi-channel. And there are many more. So actually, that's our longest configuration dialogue in, in Extreme, I would say. 
there are many, many, many options. So the redundancy concept here is to um, have um, own servers for DVB at WDR. So there are two departments that actually manage the, the internet streaming at the DVB. So they decided to separate that stuff to different servers. They also have main and backup different locations and the maxing for the satellite with other uh, ARD stations is actually done by the ARD standpoint. And um, yeah, so the maxing there's monitored if the stream is still active and if not, there's a hard switch in the case of this of this failure. Okay, yeah. Yeah. So the benefits for extreme of extreme for WDR uh, the straightforward and secure backup setup. So the simple workflow and operation, especially in critical situations. So when the redundancy is necessary, and also in the case, for example, if you want to try out new versions or if you update the systems. So you always have one working system. And so they also like that uh, they have one system to fit all their needs. Yeah, that's uh, the setup at WDR. So are there any questions? So yeah, Zacharias okay. Faust uh, asked this, I wonder if the main and backup on sync, I think this was about the IceCast specifically, so you can switch between them seamless. Yeah, as I said, that actually depends on the CDN. So the CDN, sometimes makes a synchronization of the two audio streams that are incoming from the main and the backup system so that they actually can switch seamlessly between those streams. If they do a hard switch, then I think it will be audible because the delay will not be exactly the same from the input through our system, through the internet, to different locations, from different locations. So there might be a small, small difference, but I think it will be barely hearable. And if it's not so often, I think it's not very disturbing. Yeah. In the case of case of HLS, it's better. So if the input is synchronized in our system, you only very few times hear it, the switch between these two systems. Thank you very much. And we had the question if uh, any of uh, WDR programs are video. Um, in our case, uh, everything we do, at least currently, is uh, audio only. So the next up will be Florian Wickert. Uh, he presents the, the next big project we had. So offline file processing or podcast processing with the Deutschland Radio. All right. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the second use case, which is on the example of Deutschland Radio. And the topic is on-demand processing. My name is Florian Wickert. I'm one of the software devs of Ferncast. So let's get started. So we start with a quick overview um, about on-demand processing because probably most of you are familiar with live. Um, we start at live pipes, which you've just seen. So in this example, this is an HLS pipe with two bit rates and it has a file, file input and HLS output. So when this pipe runs, it takes files on the input, runs through them from the beginning to the end and outputs HLS segmented files and HLS playlists. So that's where the file goes in and where HLS comes out. That's the, the most basic use case you can imagine. But now maybe for other input files, you want AAC encoded HLS files and not MP3, maybe because it's a concert and not a podcast. Why for the podcast, MP3 is probably good because of its compatibility. For the concert, you might want better quality. So now the input file does not really tell us how it wants to be encoded. So it also needs metadata files. Uh, files. So that's what, what we need now. Um, the metadata file tells the, the system, OK, this audio file um, wants to be encoded using this pipe or another pipe, which can even be multiple, like in this case. Maybe we, we even want for, for the concert uh, lossless files or XHE, AAC, and dash segments or whatever you imagine. So yeah, metadata is a big topic. So the system behavior is a bit different. For the live systems, we have usually a constant number of pipes, which leads to a constant uh, system load and, and also a cost, constant ingress and egress rate. 
because the, the bit rates are usually usually fixed. Even if it's variable bit rate, we still know the um, limits. So yeah, it's a classical real time system, um, which, which means um, th there are fixed points and times where we have to process the, the the buffers, or we will lose the listeners, which shouldn't happen. So what you usually do for redundancy is so-called hot redundancy, which means you have, have at least two systems doing basically the same thing at the same time. So if one system goes down or the connection is lost or something, then the other one is playing already and listeners can fall back. And ideally, they, they don't even register that something happened. So for on-demand, it's a bit different because this um, load is not uh, regular. We, we can have multiple podcasts on one day and no podcasts on the other day, or we, we can have events or concerts, which may be segmented into many uh, small um, podcast files. So the there will be load peaks and idle times, which also lead to um, irregular ingest and egress rates. So this is still a real-time system, but with different limits um, compared to the, the live system. It's still real-time because we, we want to have an upper limit on when we know when will the file be processed and available for the consumer then. So we have more options to achieve high availability. For example, you can do active backup um, redundancy, which is one, one system does all the work and once it detects that once the backup system detects the, the active system isn't really working anymore, it can take over. Or you can do load balancing, which is a bit more flexible because you can have more than just two systems, which basically means they have a shared input queue and they, they share the, the work. So if there's 10 jobs coming in, then one will do five and the other one will do five in the most basic case. So for this customer's example for Deutschland Radio, they have uh, live and on-demand systems running from Ferncast. So for live, it's extreme on bare metal, which is a good choice because it still has the, the lowest latency um, and, and it's good for um, real-time audio. For input, they are using or have used or tried um, like evaluated AES EBU, MADI, or AES67. For codecs, they also use a variety like MP3, AAC, and XHE. AAC, all at multiple bit rates usually. And the output streams are HLS, Icecast, and in the past also RTMP, but I think it's not in use anymore. And they have redundant setups for live, um, which is basically the, the same setup in Köln and Berlin. So both of these setups stream all their radio stations. For the on-demand, they are running Xtreme in a virtual machine which does have other advantages we'll, where, where I will go into soon. Um, input are audio and metadata files, as we've just seen. And also here you can use multiple codecs, multiple bit rates. And for the output, they, they use HLS and DASH. And for redundancy, load balancing between Köln and Berlin. So that's just a screenshot from the Play Store. And you can see they have more than half a million downloads and pretty good reviews, 4.4 stars. I think that's quite good. And as you can see on, on the screenshots below, they have a large variety of, of features integrated into. So if you have a custom app, there are some advantages because you can do some, some kind of all-in-one experience. You can have a live and on-demand and articles in, in one app. Of course, there are some downsides. You have to maintain your own app, which comes at a price. But there are also technical advantages, like you can control the HLS playback, which is a big topic because HLS, even though it's standardized, the players don't always do what the standard wants them to. So if, if you can control the player, it's, it's usually good because you can make it more robust. And it gives you a lot of flexibility in terms of how you want to present your content. And flexibility is a big topic for on-demand, as we will see now. Um, because for on-demand processing, there are mostly no standardized workflows. And the workflows that exist at your company, they usually change over time because there's many teams involved in 
on demand. So for us, that, that means everything in Extreme needs to be pluggable. So if, if you change one, one piece of that workflow, it should be possible to just change one piece in Extreme as well. So that means the input files, you have two options. You can pull them from some server or, the, or you can push them into Extreme. Same goes for the output files. They can be pushed on, onto an external CDN or they can be pulled from the Extreme from the, the output queue. And yeah, next question is if I get the audio and metadata files from my production, in which form do I get them? So usually I do have to match the, the files. They might have the same file name. They might be in a common directory, or you can even use regular expressions if it's something more complex to find the, the matching pairs of audio and metadata files. And there's there's a lot of options how you can do that. For the metadata as well, you have to map them from whatever file input that is. For Deutschland Radio, that's XML files. You have to map them onto the internal metadata object, which Tobias just showed to you. And also you have to use the, the metadata to, to select which pipes should be run. So um, that's from the example earlier. If, if it's a concert, I might want, want, want to run other codecs or bit rates compared to podcasts. And that's just a few examples. There's a lot more. Okay, so that's a screenshot for how you configure the on-demand in Extreme. For this, in contrast to the pipes, we have a wizard which takes you step-by-step step from um, the general settings through metadata, media, the synchronization and destinations and so on, which gives a lot of tips and does a lot of validation and, and shows you which thing, things make sense and which things don't make sense if if you configure them. So that's a big, big help in getting started. So uh, back to the customer example, there's a system overview. So as I said, they, they have two sites, Berlin and Cologne, where they produce their, their radio signals. Then at both sites, they have uh, extreme running in, in a cloud for the on-demand on for load balancing and all the radio stations sent to both of these servers. So all, all metadata and audio files go to both servers. And of course, the, the servers do some form of communication between them for the load balancing. Then after processing, both ser servers upload all files to all destinations. Um, and for the future, of course, they, they also have the option to add more systems. So let's say they, they have a new site or they, they need more processing power. This even scales horizontally and not just vertically, which means um, you can also add more systems and not just more power on the system. So yeah, and in this example, you, you can can even add more destinations in the future if you need that. So it's it's a very flexible system that, that scales up and down with your needs. So now the same example from the perspective of the, the audio and metadata files, so the, the data flow. The production system sends the audio and metadata files in to extreme, in this case, they are pushed using SFTP. Then the orchestrator inside extreme adds these files combined as a new job to the input queue. And once it's this job's turn, the metadata file is inspected. And based on that, the pipe processing starts, which can be sound preprocessing like loudness or uh, other sound processing. And of course, the encoding. And at the end, the transport is selected and can, can be one of Async, HTTP, SFTP, FTP, or Samba. And it's uploaded to um, the, the destinations that are also determined by the metadata. OK, and this all happens for all stations in parallel. So each station has its own input queue and its own processing and own configuration. So if you have different needs on different radio stations, you can use all that, that flexibility to configure this. And on top, there's an archive right in X, inside Extreme. So you can archive the audio and metadata files, which comes in handy if you change your mind later, which I will go into in the next slide. 
because making things robust is also a big topic for on demand, of course. And uh, the happy path, the path you've just seen is just the tip of the iceberg. So there's many edge cases and errors, and most of them are handled gracefully, if, if that's possible. And defective jobs are stored in a special folder, so, so you can manually inspect them if something goes wrong on the production side. Uh, for example, it, let's say a metadata file is missing and you just have the audio or the other way around. Then on, on shared systems, which is not the case for Deutschland Radio, but it's still a concern you should keep in mind um, because of the irregular system load, the on-demand processing could starve the live pipes when there are load peaks, the processing power on, on the CPU could um, exhaust or your bandwidth. So for this, we have global limits and connection pooling implemented. And another big topic is reproducibility because in on-demand processing, there are many manual steps still involved. Like you have the production, they give you the audio files and metadata and they, they type in some information about that and things will go wrong at, at some point. Um, or you might change your mind about the codecs or bit rates. So with this archive, you have the option to rerun jobs after you changed the configuration. And that's, again, that's just a small overview. There's a lot of more topics about that. For example, um, the typical workflow has many tasks. And usually, if you have more automation, then you, you get a more robust system. For this, we have, for example, applets, which you can use to, to implement customer-specific behavior. They can react on different system events, uh, and you can tell them to do different things. There's really a big choice of what they can do. Then for audit and meta metadata, if you want to call it that way, it's some idea of tracking the processing history of each job. So once you have the files on your CDN, you can still verify where they came from. Um, what happened to them in production, how were they encoded, how was the loudness adjusted, and all, all that kind of stuff. So it, that's a big help. If something is not as you expected, you can trace back what happened to this file. And then there's more topics like audio file chapters, jingle and announcement insertion, and much more, which I can't really go into detail now. So wrap up, what are the customer benefits for Deutschland Radio using Extreme? That's for one, the flexibility. So the Extreme on demand, you can integrate into your existing workflow. So you don't have to force specific software on your production team. They, they can keep using what, whatever software they, they are used to. And you can also adapt to future changes. Um, another point of the flexibility is that you can scale up and down. So once you get, let's let's say, uh, you have a small radio station and you, you grow over time, you have more stations, more events, then it's very easy to scale this system to match the needs. And also you get access to everything that's been in Extreme for the live pipes. Also like modern audio codecs, a variety of transport formats like HLS and Dash. And of course, it's easy to integrate into existing IT. You can use a virtual machine or a Docker container, which is usually the, the easiest way. And for on-demand, it's a good choice. Um, it's easy to, to monitor. We have a web API that allows you to monitor basically everything in the system, or you can even use SNMP if you want. And um, then, of course, it's a big point. We deliver constant updates, so there's new features all the time, which you always get, and it's very easy to integrate them into your workflow if you like. For example, the next generation loudness control, which you will hear about soon. Okay, and thank you. And um, if there are some questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Yeah, um, we had another question from Zacharias. If uh, we support or, so, or on-demand supports uh, other audio processing like compression limiting, et cetera. Actually, uh, compression limiting is part of the loudness processing module that is already there. But yeah, depending on the customer need, we are constantly adding features there. So. For example, we do not yet have an equalizer because nobody asked for it, but it's a thing we could truly integrate. So 
yes, it's possible. And just let us know your needs. <laughs> right. Yeah, that was the only question so far. So I guess uh, Bernd can uh, take over straight away. So yes, my name is Bernd Geisler. Um, I'm uh, also one of the main developers of Extreme. So my responsibility is um, everything that has directly touches the audio. So all the processing is uh, part of my responsibility and the formats and encoding and such stuff. And um, today I'm going to talk about a custom in use case, uh, which is our most recent, or the most recent bigger project that we had. It's for a uh, private radio station, Classic Radio, and it's about playlist scheduling. And the use case is a scheduled radio. Um, and the target platform there is the Classic Radio Select, as they call it, in a new version. And it has been launched just yesterday, so uh, you can tune in if you want. <laughs> um, um, what they do, they create um, radio channels based on curated schedules. So they use a scheduling software and um, yeah, constantly are adapting um, the stations they provide with new material and uh, edited stuff. And um, what we do provide there is uh, free channels. So they are freely available, it's 50. Uh, they are based on Icecast and um, they contain ads, of course. Um, then the other options, they have premium channels. You have to pay for that. For us, that's... Um, purely file based so the playback is organized by the classic audio app or web app and this is then ad free of course because you pay for it okay that all is based on a backend audio library with a good number of audio files which is yeah constantly being yeah it's it's growing and uh yeah here's a, a bigger diagram of what is going on in uh, that use case so um the classic radio uh, editorial stuff is uh, using in their workflow the music master scheduling software and um, basically all the work they do is inside that software which they are accustomed to and um, uh, below that there is an audio database with the files and uh, yeah extreme our software which is run on a server here uh, pulls all the information needed to generate the radio programs from the information in the, in the music master scheduling and the audio itself from the database. First step here would be to uh, pre-process and transcode the files into multi-rate AAC in that case. That goes into a huge storage at the CDN and we also have a local copy. Um, the uh, pre-processed and transcoded files are directly used in the classic audio app for the premium uh, radio. The other option is we go back to extreme here and do the uh, free radio. And that's the scheduled radio, which I'm mainly talking about. So we render the uh, complete program with crossfades and add markers and so on. And I'll put that via Icecast that goes to CDN, which is then in fact um, responsible for the ad insertion. Uh, metadata is a special case here. We do not deliver it with Icecast. The CDN, it's quantum cast, has a different protocol, so we implemented support for that. So uh, one metadata output um, format is this meta port by quantum cast. Yeah, and the Icecast, which is then at the CDN, um, is fed into the app or the web app as a free channel or also gives, goes out to aggregation services. Okay, and then there's um, this outer line metadata is of course uh, also queried by the app, for example, for additional images or stuff. So um, the motivation of uh, classic audio editorial stuff is that they want to use the convenient and uh, custom software Music Master, where they can do database editing. So it has lots of features which we really do not want to compete with. with. Uh, so you can uh, do a lot of stuff with your audio library and then tag it and then order it and assign it to stations and whatever. And uh, then you have channel schedules and editing that. So it looks like this. Um, so it's uh, really nice for a radio editor there to set up stations. Actually, this is all the editorial stuff at Cluster Radio sees. Yeah, um, so everything else is automated in our backend extreme server. 
And uh, yeah, what we do, I'll um, explain the steps in the next slides. Uh, so the first step would be to create the backend audio library. Uh, the steps are pre-processing and transcoding. And for that, we regularly query uh, the Music Master database for new or updated edited songs and apply pre-processing on that. That is a configured queue in and queue out. So we cut away start and end uh, as configured by Classic Audio. Then we do a loudness normalization. And for this, we use our new next generation loudness control algorithm. Um, and I'll go into the details of that very soon. And second step after pre-processing is, of course, transcoding. So AAC with multiple bit rates and then upload to an S3 bucket the CDN. OK, the next generation loudness control. Um, this is right now available in the next extreme version, 3.7. And you can pre-process files with it. And the user can set a target for uh, loudness and a single peak. And um, then you can se select a, a, a preset because the algorithm has loads of parameters. But we have reasonable presets there, which we have tuned with uh, yeah, renowned sound engineers, which have helped us out there configuring the whole thing so that it uh, delivers a good performance. But nevertheless, you can also create your own setups. Uh, and for that, we provide a UI tool where you can create custom profiles for that loudness control. And I'll show you the UI of uh, that uh, tool here. Um, yeah, yes, there you see an example where you have um, loaded a file. It has a measured loudness, it has a loudness range, it has a peak. And then you set targets for your loudness processing and then and, 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 and other parameters. Uh, it's not all what is shown here. And after processing, you see that this comes out. So the um, true peak and the loudness has been matched as desired and try to yeah, retain as much from the loudness range as possible over the entire file. And an example of uh, what is going on is, can be seen in, in, in this graph, uh, the momentary loudness. You see that there are portions in the file which are raised by a good amount and uh, other portions only by a very slight amount. So uh, here you can really see that um, the algorithm can, if you want it to, uh, work differently for different sections of the audio. For this, it obviously needs to look at the entire file and that's uh, what's, of course, for file processing. OK, uh, internally, of course, we use leveling and limiting. It's the usual thing. Um, we have up to four parameter sets, which you can define differently for different operating points of the system. And uh, those parameter sets are automatically switched depending on the current signal. Um, and then uh, what is internally going on is an iterative optimization process. So we trade off um, the R. 128 loudness, the R128 true peak, and uh, the EBU loudness range. So that's a trade-off of all those three to reach the optimum point there. And what we actually achieve is, yeah, consistent loudness experience, um, uh, even for longer pieces with multiple, let's say, dynamically diverse parts. Yeah, and that turned out to re work really well. And we have pre-processed the entire classic audio library with this, so you can listen to the results, actually. So let's come back to the customer. How do we produce uh, the radio from the Music Master schedules? Yeah, that's for the free channels of this Classic Radio Select uh, product. Um, we also regularly query the channel schedules from the Music Master for all the 50 free channels. We download the required audio files, obviously. Then we enqueue those files in a pre-configured pipe. So this file source gets updated automatically on a regular schedule with the current playout schedule. And um, then this pipe renders the crossfades as planned and inserts app markers and uh, puts out the whole thing to the CDN. Uh, we also have um, error resiliency implemented in place. Uh, for example, if a file is somehow unavailable or there was a, uh, couldn't be downloaded or other things, then there's a 
possibility to automatically fix up the playoff schedule. Uh, the file will be left out and everything else will be moved accordingly so that we have a seamless experience. Okay, output I told it is by Icecast protocol. The metadata is directly queried from the Music Master database um, as well. And in this special case, it is encoded into a CDN specific format. It's this quantum cast metapod format, which we also support for all your metadata if you have that application. Okay, um, uh, let me wrap up. Um, of course, um, the customer benefits again. So here, as Florian uh, also mentioned for the Deutschland Radio use case, it's a big benefit if the customer can work in a familiar environment. So the, the editorial stuff at Classic Radio can use the custom software and purely operate in Music Master and everything else is being done in the background as configured. Also, we do have a single cost-efficient system for the encoding of the free and the premium channels. And uh, we have this new NGLC algorithm where we can produce a homogeneous sound throughout the entire program and all channels. And one big benefit here is, yes, it's a custom tailored solution to a certain extent for that use case, but we took good care that it's still easily adaptable for related and also new use cases. And that's what I wanted to tell you. I'd be happy to answer questions. As, as far as I can see, no questions so far, but there will be another opportunity at the uh, very end if uh, something still comes to mind. So I believe we can uh, hand over back to Virginie. Yes, thanks, Thomas, uh, Florian, and uh, Bernd for sharing your expertise. And uh, congratulations for the successful launch of uh, Classic uh, Radio. We got another happy uh, customer. And as you could see, Xtreme is a, is a flexible uh, software solution tailored to our customer and, uh, customers' needs to help them optimize their audio workflow. So if you have any question or project or request, please uh, contact us. We will be happy to, uh, to help you. Let's have a look at the answer of the quiz. It was a really a precise question in the last presentation. And here is uh, the answer. And I think with Tobias, we got a good uh, and a fast answer from uh, Richard. That's right. So Richard, congratulations. You won a, a fancast polo and a fancast cap. We'll be happy to send it over to you. I don't know if we still have Thank some... You. Question in the chat. Yeah, we had uh, one more um, about the time when the uh, NGLC is applied before or after the audio encoding. Talking about uh, the classic audio use case. Yeah, yeah, that's before the audio encoding. Yeah. One more. Um, does the on-demand code support uploading via plain HTTP uh, put? Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so all of our systems can upload through all what we call file transports. And HTTP is one of them. You can choose between put or post. Um, yeah, it's it's pluggable. So, so you can choose HTTP, async, and all, all these. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. And if you have any more other questions or, or requests, please contact uh, Tobias, our product expert. Uh, we'd be uh, really uh, happy to... Uh, to help you. So I would like to thank you again for taking uh, time today uh, with us. Thanks to all our experts for the great um, and deep uh, presentation. I wish you all a nice uh, day and see you in the next uh, Fancast webinar. Goodbye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Goodbye, Goodbye everyone. Goodbye. Goodbye.